Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. It's hard to know what are the precise words to use to describe the situation in Sri Lanka. Is the country witnessing a popular uprising? And has governance and much of the state actually collapsed? Those are two of the key issues I shall raise today with the Executive Director of Sri Lanka Center for Policy Alternatives, Dr. Paikyasothi Sarvanamutu. Dr. Sarvanamutu, arguably Saturday was perhaps the worst day in Sri Lanka's nearly 75 years of independence, when thousands stormed the president's house, the president's secretariat, the prime minister's official residence, and later in the evening, his private house was set on fire. How would you describe what happened on Saturday? Would you call it a popular uprising? Or does it in some senses approximate a people's power revolution similar to what we saw in 1986 in the Philippines when Ferdinand Marcos was driven out of office and succeeded by Corazon Aquino? Yeah, I would say the latter. What happened that day was very much an expression of the power of the people. They felt that they'd had enough, that it is only them expressing their anger, their frustration, their bitterness, whatever that could get Gothabe Rajpaksa out. They have been demonstrating and protesting for this outcome now for a couple of months. And they succeeded. And they succeeded in doing it non-violently. Apart from the burning of the prime minister's personal residence, and there are questions there with regard to who actually did it, as to whether the protesters were in any way involved or not. Apart from that, it was a really peaceful, non-violent expression of people's power. They were sending the message out that, look, we are the people, we are the people who are sovereign, therefore we have the power, you cannot ignore us. So this is people's power that we've witnessed, people's power very similar to what we saw in the Philippines in the mid-80s. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Now, sorry, I interrupted you, please carry on. No, go ahead, no, go ahead. President Go Gotabaya Rajapaksha has verbally told the speaker that he will resign on the 13th. There's speculation that he's chosen the 13th because it happens to coincide with the first full moon in July, which apparently is an auspicious occasion for Sinhalese Buddhists. Could there be some truth to that speculation? Well, President Gotabaya Rajapaksha was supposed to have an astrologer called Nanaka who he is said to have consulted fairly frequently. And she was supposed to therefore be a key opinion maker and influencer as far as Sri Lankan government was concerned. So I'm not, I won't be surprised if there is that element to it, because as you know, a lot of our South Asian politicians do rely on astrologers and uh, various superstitions. So that's entirely possible, but it's extremely important that the letter is sent to the speaker, because without that letter, nothing else can happen as far as the constitutional process is concerned. You've taken the words out of my mouth in a sense, Dr. Sarvanamutu. Do you believe the president will actually resign on the 13th? And I'll point out the 13th is just 24 hours away. 
or is he simply playing for time because that critical letter to the speaker which will formalize his resignation still hasn't been sent he's spoken verbally to the speaker apparently he's spoken verbally to the present prime minister ranil vikramasinghe but that critical letter is missing no absolutely i hope and pray that he does send that letter and that you know this is not another ruse for him to continue in office i don't quite see though as to what he hopes to achieve by being in office given that the protests will only intensify the protests will only intensify and then you could have the possibility of violence yet again so he has to go it's absolutely important that the letter is sent so this prevarication this deliberate delay in sending the letter is tantamount to playing with fire absolutely absolutely it is tantamount to playing with fire because the protesters are not going to accept gotabe rajapaksa as president of sri lanka anymore now the bbc on sunday reported that president rajapaksa was on a sri lankan naval ship but very much within sri lankan territorial waters yesterday the french news agency agence france presse reported that in fact he had been taken to an air force base at katunaika which is adjacent to bandranaika international airport do these moves suggest that he is preparing to flee the country yes i just i suspect that that is what it is all about he is even if he does not resign I don't think he plans to stay in the country. He could say that he is going abroad for medical purposes or whatever, and have an acting president in his stead. Uh, but yes, he is not going to remain in Sri Lanka. I think that's what this shows, because he can't show himself in public. He can't. He hasn't yet spoken to the people of Sri Lanka directly. The communication is through the speaker. would the protesters would the tens of thousands that have occupied his residence his secretary the prime minister's official house accept this ruse that he fails to formally resign but says instead that he's going abroad for medical treatment and appoints a caretaker president in his absence would they accept that no i don't think they would they will see through it as a ruse and they will continue their protests until that letter is sent but with him out of the island i'm not quite sure as to what exactly they could do but nevertheless i am quite sure that the demand of the protesters that gotabe rajpaksa must go will persist now if the president does resign and there has to be as of this moment a huge if there but if he does resign the speaker will temporarily take over for 30 days on the assumption that the prime minister also fulfills his own intention to resign and within that 30 day period parliament must elect a new president how easy will that be are there any obvious names or is that going to be the first problem well there are about three or four people who have been suggested but it is very clear that all political parties must put aside their partisan differences and interests and think in terms of what is in the interests of the country because if we have a protracted struggle as it were to elect a new president then i think we are in a very very bad situation and the consequences of that would be difficult to define at this point but they would be dire no so i think that there are a couple of names that have been suggested and one needs to coalesce around one or two or indeed one so that we can have a speedy process and get back to some sort of normalcy and get back to the negotiations with the IMF and all of that get a new government as fast as possible now it has been mooted that the leader of the largest opposition party sajid premadasa himself the son of a former president is putting himself forward as the new president however he has only a party with some 50 odd seats it's also said that to get sufficient support he might choose a dissident mp from the rajapaksa slpp as prime minister does that combination make sense to you could it work well it would work as long as the other members of parliament agree to it first of all they would have to vote in sachit premadasa as president 
And secondly, they would have to accept whoever he chooses as prime minister because the prime minister then could be turfed out if they disagree by a vote of no confidence. So whatever the combinations are, it is important that we choose the most competent and credible people and put aside the party differences. You've put your finger in a sense on the nub of the problem, haven't you, Dr. Sarvanamuthu? Because the new president has to be supported by a majority in parliament, but by far the biggest party in parliament with a majority on its own is the Rajapaksa SLPP. So whoever is president, the Rajapaksas would have to accept that they are willing to have this person. Yes, but with the two-thirds majority that the SLPP has in parliament, it's by no means certain that that two-thirds majority is a homogenous block, that they too have their differences and they have various factions amongst them. So dissident factions within the SLPP could actually provide a majority for, say, for example, someone like Sajid Premadasa, where everyone Absolutely. else could coalesce around him. Absolutely. Yes, that could well happen. Let's then come at this point to the second missing piece in the puzzle that has to be fitted in. And that is the future of Prime Minister Ranan Vikramasinghe. Now, he's indicated that he too is willing to resign, but he seems to have added a condition if an all-party government can be formed to replace him. Can an all-party government be formed to replace him? That's the first question. And secondly, since constitutionally he is the automatic successor when Gotabaya Rajapaksa does resign, or if he does resign, might that be an occasion for Mr. Vikramasinghe to change his mind about his own resignation? Because then the road would have been cleared to him becoming president. Well, all of that, what you say, is technically and constitutionally possible insofar as, yes, if the president resigns, the prime minister is the one who takes up that position. But Ranil Vikramasinghe has said that he will leave as soon as our all party government is formed. So as soon as the new president is elected, and as soon as that president nominates a prime minister and a new government is formed, I have no doubts that Mr. Vikramasinghe will stand by his word and go. Now, now there the are... question... Sorry, please carry the on. Question... The, the question, of course, is will Mr. Vikramasinghe be a part of the new government. There is a school of thought that says that, look, he has started the negotiations with the IMF. He has good international, he has international goodwill behind him, etc. It would be good for him to continue as finance minister. But those are questions that have to be looked at later. The important thing now is the resignation by Gotabe Rajpaks and the election of a new president. But there is a serious possibility that he could continue in the new government, even if it's headed by, say, Sajid Premadasa as president, as the new finance minister, or as the person who continues as finance minister. Yes, that's possible. That is possible. Tell me something else. Will Mr. Vikramasinghe follow the timetable that's been laid down by parliament? Apparently, the speaker has said the parliament will meet on the 15th. Nominations for the new president will come in by the 19th and the election will happen on the 20th. Will Mr. Vikramasinghe follow that timetable? Will he be happy to do so? I think, yes, he would be happy to do so. The question also of him being part of a new government, I suppose, also depends on whether the people in the Argale or the struggle, the protesters, will accept him as part of a new government. That is a question that has to be looked into. But I think as far as the timetable is concerned, I don't think he should have any problems with it. What's your answer to your question? It makes a lot of good sense to retain Ranil Vikramasinghe as finance minister, both because he's established contacts with the IMF and because he has a lot of international recognition. But will the protesters who are adamant to see his resignation accept him continuing in a lower capacity as finance minister? What's your answer to that question? Well, I would imagine, though, that the protesters would not want to see Ranil Vikramasinghe as part of government, given all that has happened. But the argument of those who say that he should be finance minister or that he should continue with the discussions with the IMF, there is a sound basis for that, given his 
expertise, his experience, the international goodwill, and all of that. So he may not be then finance minister, but hopefully his expertise and experience can be brought to bear on the continuing discussions with the fund. Now, there are a lot of, how shall I put it, ifs and buts in the scenarios we've been discussing. There are a lot of conditionalities that we don't have the answer to. Is there therefore a danger that the government may completely collapse without any coherent replacement, thus pushing the country closer and closer to political anarchy? That is always a possibility, and that is the one that has to be averted at all costs, because we need political stability before we can go on to conclude that agreement with the IMF. I mean, that has been derailed to a certain extent, or delayed at least, to a certain extent. So political stability is tremendously important, and that is where the members of this parliament should recognize that they have a considerable responsibility resting on their shoulders, and they should therefore look to a consensus as to what the national interest is. As you said, political anarchy is always one possibility that looms on the horizon. Is there a danger to avert it that the army may step in? Could you see some form of army poch or coup in an attempt to stabilize the situation, even if it's arguably said this is only a temporary measure? Well, I mean, so far the army has not done that. The army has, in effect, stood with the people by and large, and the dangers of military intervention on the part of the government, on the side of the government, or to instill a sense of law and order and all of that, that that danger has not materialized as yet. But if we go to a situation of utter anarchy, then of course, this prospect becomes much more real. So at the moment, because we cannot rule out the possibility of utter anarchy, we also can't rule out the possibility, slim though it may be, of a military putsch or coup. Yes, we can't rule it out. And hopefully, if that is the case, and let's hope not, if that is the case, it hopefully will be temporary to restore law and order rather than to take over government. Meanwhile, it was announced from Washington that Sri Lanka would get a visit from a delegation from the IMF sometime in the next few days. At one point in time, it was even suggested it could happen as early as next week. Separately, there is also news of another delegation from the World Food Programme coming. In the present circumstances, is there a real danger that these critical visits, upon which the financial and economic future of the country depends, as well as its food sustenance, could be delayed, perhaps indefinitely delayed? Yes, that, that, is, that is exactly why we have to move fast. That's why that letter has to come. And the Speaker must, along with Parliament, act to, in effect, get, give the country a new government. Because the conversations with the IMF are delayed. The conversations with the FAO, the WHO, and all of that are also impeded by a lack of a clear government. You know, so we need to have a restoration of the agencies of power and authority in the country. One thing I did notice is that roughly 48 hours ago, the army chief issued a call for calm and peace. It's not the sort of normal step that army chiefs do in a democracy. And certainly in Sri Lanka, army chiefs have never overstepped the mark. Is this a sign that the army chief might be harboring some sort of, how should I put it, Bonapartist inclinations? Well, I certainly hope not. And I would like to think that that was a request made in the national interest and not as a harbinger to proactive military intervention in the affairs of the state. In these circumstances, what sort of help can India offer? The Indian papers 24 hours ago were talking about a shipment of urea that is likely to reach Sri Lankan shores shortly. But would I be right in saying that petrol and diesel at this stage would be much more welcome? Well, yes. I mean, India has given us something like 3.5 billion US dollars in assistance. And of course, we need more. And we certainly look to India's assistance in this respect. Yes, we need fuel. 
We need petrol. We need gas. And we need the medicines and the food. So in all of those areas, any further assistance by India would be most welcome. Importantly, India has said that it stands with the people of Sri Lanka. It hasn't mentioned government. It hasn't mentioned political parties or anything like that. And I think that is a very good position that India has adopted. And hopefully, India will be able to work with a legitimate, credible government of Sri Lanka to get this country out of the mess it is in. Not so long ago, Ranan Vikramasinghe said that, in fact, envoys or delegations were being sent both to Qatar as well as to Russia to request supplies of oil. Did Sri Lanka receive favorable responses? Well, we don't know. Qatar, of course, was with gas because they don't have oil. And in the Russian case, we have to get the crude oil and then refine it. Uh, we don't know as to what the exact agreements, if any, came out of those visits. And what about China, Dr. Savanamutu? Under the Rajapaksas, China was often thought of as the preferred ally of Sri Lanka. Has China been willing to step up to the plate at this hour of need? Well, China has been maintaining something of a distance. And I think the reason for it is, is that the Chinese are not too keen on the idea that all creditors should be treated equally because they do not want to have that haircut. If they do that with regard to Sri Lanka, they would have to do that with any number of other countries lining up for their assistance. So whilst they are saying that they will give us assistance in the meantime to bridge us over this uh, period, this interim period, the real question and the IMF deal, I think, will depend to a fair amount on this, is their willingness to agree to take the haircut with all the other creditors of Sri Lanka. So China's reluctance could make the situation for Sri Lanka considerably worse because they could hamper and delay any agreement with the IMF. Yes, that is true. That is correct. Yeah. We're coming to the end of this interview. One of the impressions the world has gained, particularly after those dramatic, unprecedented scenes on Saturday, is that Sri Lankans have lost all faith in politics and in politicians in particular. How worried are you about the situation developing in your country? Well, yes, they have lost faith in the existing political class or the 225 members of parliament. But hopefully they will not lose faith in democracy in parliamentary democracy. And that is why we need to move towards an election. We need to have new people coming in, people who will have the credibility, who will have the expertise, and indeed the experience too, to put us on the right track as far as governance is concerned. We need to start afresh. We need to rewrite our social contract. How confident are you that Sri Lankans haven't lost faith in democracy after all? The Rajapaksas came to power with a huge democratic majority, one which was celebrated by the country, one which was taken by many as a triumph of the will of the Sri Lankan people. So how confident are you today that the disillusionment with the Rajapaksas won't lead to a disillusionment with democracy itself? Well, given what has happened so far and given that the argale or the struggle they have put out a series of demands in terms of what they want to see as far as governance is concerned, I still have a considerable amount of faith in our people's belief that democracy is the best form of government and that, yes, we've had temporary setbacks in terms of the way that it has functioned, but that they have the will and the resolve to put us back on the right tracks. In which case, my last question... How do you see the next one month in Sri Lanka? Well, I hope and I pray that in the next man month in Sri Lanka, we will have an acting president, an interim government. We will have an ab abolition of the executive presidency, which will be voted for by two thirds of our parliament and a referendum, which can be done along with a general election. Then I'm very tempted to ask you this, if your hopes and prayers are borne out, 
and I join you in sharing those hopes and prayers, what will Sri Lanka look like six months from now or a year from now? Or is it just too difficult to say? I think it's too difficult to say, but hopefully in six to eight months, we can begin to outline the trajectory of recovery. We can sort of begin to put ourselves back on the road to recovery, but it's going to take about one and a half years to go back to the pre-crisis situation and indeed about 10 years to set all of this right because there are deep systemic problems that have to be dealt with. In other words, Sri Lanka has lost a whole decade as much as that. Unfortunately, I believe so. Dr. Saranamathu, thank you very much for this interview and in particular for explaining the intricacies as well as the question marks and doubts about the political situation in your country. Take care, stay safe. Thank you, Karan. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.